Good morning. My name is Lukas Sukalis, and I shall be moderating the session on the subject of European deterrent, or in simple words, can Europe enhance its capacity to defend itself? It is a one or multi-trillion euro question to which there can be either a simple and short answer or a much longer and complicated one. The short and simple answer that some people would be tempted to give would be no chance. The longer one is the one I expect our eminently qualified panel to give, which is, and I would like them, if possible, to concentrate on at least a number of questions. Number one, what do we understand by European deterrent? Number two, how does a European closer defense cooperation relate to NATO? Number three, does the creation eventually of a European defense pillar require a redefinition of the transatlantic relationship? And number four, how much can we expect in the foreseeable future? Now, we have, as I said, three very well qualified people to talk about it. Jolyon Howarth, who is to my left, is an expert on European defense cooperation, emeritus professor at Bath University, and formerly Yale and Harvard. Uh, Bruno Tertre is a deputy director of Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris, so strategic research, an expert on nuclear issues, if I understand correctly. And last but not least, Daniela Schwarzer, who is the executive director of Open Society Foundations for Europe and Eurasia, an expert on German foreign policy and European foreign policy. So I would also ask each one of you to say a few words about the country you know best, especially because you come from countries that are expected to play a decisive role in European defense cooperation, including a country that has decided to leave the European Union, but yet expected to be a key player in European defense in the future. So let me start with Jolyon Howarth. Jolyon, you have the floor. Thank you, Lucas. Um, I want to start really by drawing our attention to the fact that before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the European Union was essentially missing in action. The European Union per se, the member states were there. This was all done bilaterally between Moscow and Washington. And they basically, if you interrogate them closely, the European Union member states did not agree on anything. They didn't agree on Russia policy. They didn't agree on Ukraine policy. They didn't agree on sanctions policy. They didn't agree on sending arms to Ukraine. And so uh, the, um, the EU essentially was a bystander. And then after the 24th of February, we get into a situation where EU leaders would have us believe that the European Union has sort of sprung Phoenix-like back to life and uh, everything is going to be all right on the night. Um, Josep Borrell said we had made more progress in a week than in the previous decades of debate. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen talked about the blink of an eye or the switch of a time. Everything is happening all very, very fast. Now, before we crack open the superpower champagne, I think we need to take a little bit of a step back and ask some serious questions because ultimately whatever has been done, and a lot has been done, uh, as many panels have already testified, this is all being done under a renewed and very large visible American umbrella. So, um, you know, I don't need to go through the achievements. Uh, we've seen all that. The, the, the revolution in Germany, which I'm sure Daniela will talk about, um, the uh, lethal arms sales, the sanctions, all of this. We know all of this. Uh, this is actually classical in international relations theory terms. This is classical balancing behavior. When an entity sees its interests directly threatened, it balances. I mean, this is IR 101, if you like. I want to just focus for a little while on a document that people have talked about in other panels, and that is the st strategic compass. Uh, this is a document of 47 pages that uh, was published on the 21st of March, which has been in, the, in gestation for over two years. Uh, those who are well disposed to it, including somebody like Jean-Luc Borrell, 
will caution that this is not a magic wand, this is not a silver bullet. Everything depends on the behaviour of the member states. I've read um, umpteen pieces that have been published since the 24th of February about the strategic compass, uh, which are much more sceptical. There are huge gaps between the sort of constant exhortations that we must do better and faster and more effectively and more efficiently. Everything has to be done more robustly, etc., etc. We almost exhaust the thesaurus in exhortatory verbs. Uh, and, in fact, when you look very closely, the relatively small number of key deliverables. This is not a strategy, it's certainly not a deterrent, uh, and we have to be very careful about this. It, it, it has a depressing similarity to many similar documents that have been generated over the last 25 years, exhortations, etc. Um, the capacity element that uh, is in the document, these are the new capacities that the European Union is giving itself, are essentially the same as the ones that have been in all of the previous documents over the last 20 years or so with the possible exception of maritime cooperation and space. The question is, how is all this going to be achieved? And there's very little about that in the document. And the major absence, to answer one of Lucas's key questions, is that there is nothing about the relationship between the EU and its common security and defence policy, CSDP, and NATO. So, uh, I want to focus in the last couple of minutes that I have on what I see as the four structural weaknesses which have to date resulted in the European Union not really getting its security act together. First one is leadership. There has to be leadership and there's been a hell of a debate about leadership. It seems to me now that the gap between Germany and France is narrowing, at least at leadership level but not probably at public opinion level. But again, to answer a question that Lucas asked, one of my nationalities, British, is a mystery, and we don't know where British policy is going to go. I wrote a paper a couple of years ago saying that the only leadership potential for Europe is Franco-British. That was after Brexit. So leadership is a problem. Nukes, I'm going to leave to Bruno, but the nuclear aspect of any deterrent is absolutely critical and Europe is nowhere near as where that is. The third one, I would say, is a serious grand strategy. The strategic compass is not a grand strategy. If you define grand strategy as the calculated relationship between means and large ends, this is not a grand strategy. What is it that the European Union could realistically expect to achieve in the southern neighbourhood and in the eastern neighbourhood? We don't really address that critical question. But I'm going to end on what I see as the fundamental uh, weakness, both in the compass and in the situation. That is the relationship between CSDP, let's call it the European Security and Defence Policy, on the one hand, and NATO. As a, NATO exists, and it isn't going away. And it has become more prominent, if not dominant, throughout this crisis. As long as the Americans are there and prepared to do what Europeans require them to do, the limitations of CSDP are very real. This is something that has to be done en bonne intelligence, my other nationality, with the Americans. If this is not worked out properly with the Americans through NATO, it's not going to happen. I actually argued at one of Lucas's conferences here about 15 years ago for the first time that the answer is that CSDP should merge with NATO. There has to be intensive cooperation with NATO because it is profoundly, and this is my very last word, in the interests of the United States as it is in the interests of the European Union for the European Union to become less, if not non-dependent. This is in both of our interests and that is the way we have to go. Thank you, Jolien. Uh, one word you mentioned is leadership. And in defense cooperation, France has always been the country that led the way, more ambitious than anybody else, and also with a nuclear asset and with ideas about it. So Bruno Tertre will he enlighten us on French leadership in European defence cooperation. That, that was actually not my intention at all. If you don't mind, I'm going to leave out two aspects, okay. the French aspect and the nuclear aspect, that I, <laughs> okay. at this point in time. But I, 
want to address your questions instead. Okay. The questions you raised in the uh, beginning of your But at some point you will tell us about French leadership. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so before I do that, however, uh, you asked us to talk about the, uh, the notion of European deterrence. And deterrence is deterrence against aggression, and that's not really the mission of the CSDP. CSDP is not mostly about deterrence of aggression. It's also about humanitarian operations, peacekeeping operations, uh, etc. Maybe some forms of counterterrorism operation. But CSDP is mostly not about deterrence. Now, does this mean that Europe has no role to play in terms of deterring aggression? No, I think it does. And there are f four questions I'd like to address. Two of them are those, actually, you raised. Uh, should European countries beef up their defense and security expenditures in the current context? Obviously, yes, for many of them, although some of them, Greece, France, others, uh, you know, non-EU countries such as the UK, have already led the way, in a sense. But certainly, some other European countries have yet to catch up with what I think is a reasonable level of defense and security expenditures for the current uh, context, because this is going to be helpful, for the, first of all, for themselves, second for NATO, and third for the EU. So it's a win-win-win, in a sense. Now, of course, as, let me put my French hat now, as uh, Defense Minister Florence Barry said, uh, Article 5 is not Article F35, and sometimes the French believe that not buying only American uh, is also a good way to make sure that we will be more relevant defense-wise. Uh, so question two, should the EU have an ability to deter aggression? I would say currently that yes, but only as a backstop. The backstop for circumstances in which, for instance, there wouldn't be any consensus at the North Atlantic Council. That could happen. I'm looking at you know, 2024 and the possibility of a new Trump or Trump-like US president. And also because obviously some deterrent situations are not covered by NATO. I'm thinking about Finland and Sweden so far, although in a few months from now, one can reasonably expect they will be covered by Article 5. One can only think also of uh, situations uh, of 42.7 like. Mm. And in this country, you have a big neighbor, uh, which uh, obviously, uh, should there be any significant problem between you and this big neighbor, that would not be covered by NATO Article 5 either. Obviously, as this country knows very well, there is now, in addition to 42.7, a bilateral French-Greek agreement of uh, mutual defense, which I think was a really non-trivial affair on the French side. It was re we recognized something that we take very seriously. So yes, Europe should have some ability. I, I like using the word backstop, which I discovered during the Brexit negotiation. But I think it's a very useful word in many respects. Third country, can you have a European pillar in NATO? No, I don't think you can. It's a very old canard, which I don't think means anything, because the founding principle of NATO is to gain consensus in the North Atlantic Council with the help of American leadership. That's what NATO is about. We may like it, dislike it, but the, that's how NATO operates. So this idea of having a pillar doesn't make sense at all, especially since you have, still today, and probably yet tomorrow, countries in the EU which are not members of NATO and countries of NATO which are not members of the EU. So I've always been highly skeptical of this concept of a European pillar, which for me is a very 1980s kind of concept, not a concept for the 2020s. Finally, could Europe defend itself alone if needed, which is not the case today. And I would just encourage at this point, just for the sake of debate, uh, people to refrain from definitive judgments one way or the other about this. It's not a yes or no question. It's not a black and white question. Defend itself against what exactly, when, and with what external support. Those are the key questions. Obviously, if you ask yourself, it's by some kind of Magic trick, the United States disappeared from the uh, face of the planet today. Uh, it would be very difficult for Europe to take up the same kind of deterrence and defense missions that we're doing now with our American friends. Mm -hmm. But that's not the situation you're talking about. The situation is more if one day the United States was less interested or 
was more involved in defending allies and friends in East Asia, which may very well happen not next year, but in five years from now, then the question would be different. But the United States would still be there. Um, and finally, I would say that there are not only uh, determinants of defense is not only about hard security. We are all looking very much at hard security today because of the tanks literally rolling across the plains of northern Ukraine. But it's also about cyber, for instance. Can Europe defend itself on its own against some form of cyber aggression? I would say certainly yes. Uh, can Europe defend itself against some form of terrorist aggression? I would say certainly yes. So the context, the Ukraine context, looms very large today and legitimately so. But we have to broaden the scope of our thinking when we think about the sort of future situations where in five to ten years from now, Europe may have to defend itself. And finally, don't forget that it takes one tweet. It takes one tweet by the next American president to completely force us to revamp our assumptions. <laughs> so uh, we've been there before. We may get back there. And it's where I put my French, back, my French head back on. The French do like have their European partners think uh, all the time about what would happen if. Okay. So what if, we shall come back to the what if a bit later. Daniela, is it, apart from my initial questions, has it really been a revolution in German policy <laughs> or not? Yeah, I'm happy to come to that point as well, Lucas, and thank you for having me. So I think I will tell the same story with a slightly different emphasis from Jolian. If I look at what Europe has achieved in terms of defense, the accelerator definitely was now Russia, which early enough to redesign slightly the strategic compass, which was published in March, started the war in Ukraine. But we have to go back a few years, and it was really the Trump administration which triggered Europe to think about defense cooperation in a much more forward-leaning way. And if we remember back then, it's a technical term, but still PESCO, the Structured Defense Corporation, which was launched in 2018, it is not in any way moving Europe closer to having a European army. But it is, I would say, a, an, an effort to enhance cooperation between countries and to think more strategically about procurement, about armament projects, about investment. And although the results we can see today, after three years of implementing this, are not yet where I would want Europe to be in terms of defense, it lays the groundwork. Why are we so slow? Obviously, this is the most sensitive area of national sovereignty. And given the efforts for Europeans to work together, which go back decades to the 1950s, I think you know, we, we shouldn't over-expect more than only cooperation between countries because none of the EU governments at this point would be ready to give up sovereignty in that area. So what we can hope for is more joint risk analysis and assessment of the situation. And I think the strategic compass does deliver something there because it is the first time that Europeans together actually set out their view on their joint security situation. And if you travel around European capitals, you will quite naturally get different narratives about where we are, what the biggest threat is. But the effort, and this is not just in one paper, but it is a continuous effort, to constantly have a dialogue on where the biggest threat is, is something very important. And I'm saying this against the backdrop of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Had we listened more to the Baltic states, our Central and Eastern European EU members and our neighbors, we would have had a more realistic assessment of what the troop buildup on the borders of Ukraine means. And I think it is one of the weaknesses, and I'm not excluding Germany here at all, um, to be ready in a new and much more dangerous security environment in our neighborhood, but also globally, to think through the worst case scenarios and prepare for them. There is a reluctance still to do that, and I think, and I'll come to the German response since the war, Russia's war in Ukraine started in Germany, things have changed. But we are not, in my view, where we should be. Now, can Europe defend itself? Obviously not. We are highly dependent on, you, on the US. Um, 
all the efforts that have been made since the Trump administration on the European side are about, in my view, improving European countries' contribution to NATO as a result, because you asked us also to think in terms of the alliance. I don't think we are aiming at, and we should be aiming at, a European pillar. But in order to prepare for the next US presidency, which may not be so deeply anchored in transatlantic relations, and Biden said he's back, the question of for us needs to be for how long is the US back? Um, we need to do two things. One is we need to make NATO more attractive to the Americans and contribute more. And on the other hand, that way, we need to enhance our own ability to act, our own capacities to act. And in my view, it is not only Trump and Russia, which I've talked about, but there's also another um, important event in between, and that is the West withdrawal from Afghanistan. The fact that Europeans were simply able to follow the withdrawal, the evacuation, with all terms set by DC, and if you asked around Europe, would we have been able to secure Kabul airport? The answer would probably have been, in terms of capabilities, yes, but would we have been able to act quickly enough to actually do it? Together as Europeans, the answer would probably have been no. And that is where one of our weaknesses lie. Now, very briefly on Germany. Um, essentially, what happened, in my view, is a, a rethink of Germany's Russia policy. So there's no way not to be self-critical for the previous government of, and those who are now still in government of a failed Russia policy and a misassessment of what Putin was doing. The German view was, despite the annexation of Crimea and the ongoing war in the Donbas, that it is better to have close economic ties, in particular energy, because this creates interdependence. And I remember even when the troops were all sitting on the Ukrainian eastern border, having had conversations in Berlin, where people told me, it's not rational for him to go into this war. <laughs> the costs are far too high. Imagine he loses this and that, sanctions on what we have all now seen. And I think the point here has to be, there's a different rationality. And we could read it in Putin's writings after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. We could even hear it in 2007 and 8. And we saw it in summer 221. And I would say in Germany there was a rather small community of people who took that very seriously. And then there was a larger community which still stuck to the old paradigm. And part of that was driven by the thought we simply cannot imagine and afford a conflict with a country that close, essentially being you know, the EU's neighbor through, or even through proxies like Belarus, but also with real borders to EU countries. We can't afford a conflict. And now what happened is, first of all, a redefinition of Russia policy. The most substantive changes already lie in energy policy, uh, both announcement, that's also real change, like alternative deals, um, to reduce energy dependency. There's no consensus yet on an embargo on gas and oil, but I think the readiness to think about you know, different steps of sanctioning um, on oil and gas are there. We've seen coal last night as part of the fifth sanction package the EU agreed upon. Um, on defense, um, first of all, a credible commitment as of this year to meet the 2% NATO goals, which has been around for so long as a goal, and no government actually, oh, the last government worked towards it, but very slowly, never really made it credible that Germany was doing that. Now there's credibility with that, and it is thanks to a new extra fund of 100 billion euros, which is supposed to, first of all, fund part of the uh, annual contribution or annual defense spending, but which is also there to, to fund major defense investment projects. Now the sad reality is much of that is going to fill gaps and existing commitments that Germany has with EU partners and within NATO which is about 40, 45 billion euros, which go just into those commitments over the next few years. 
There's extra money on top of that because we're going up to 100 billion euros. Um, but that is also partly modernizing the equipment of the army in very simple terms, very basic stuff. So for the bigger projects, um, German, the, the current German government is very clear. On the one hand, it has committed to buying the F-35. So commitment to transatlantic and nuclear deterrence and nuclear sharing with the US. But in the same sentence, a commitment to France, the balance that the government has to strike is between buying quickly something that works and that is operational, not to decredibilize nuclear sharing with the US, and at the same time sticking to its previous commitments with France, which is essentially the big FCAS project, but which will only be operational in many years. So I guess this is where I see the situation at the moment. Um, the debate will be, right now it's backed by the public, but it will be a strong leadership task for the government within Germany, but also to find its new role within the EU, because we are now far outspending France. Of course, we are not a nuclear power, won't be, but still a different player on defense within the European Union. Thank you very much. Now, one conclusion I draw from what Bruno and Daniela said, and I put it very provocatively, is that American elections are likely to be much more decisive in European defense cooperation than anything that Putin has done or may do in the future. Still, wait for the French elections. Yes. Okay, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Now, we've got five minutes, so briefly, one and a half minute each. Jolion, do you agree that a European defense pillar as part of NATO really does not make any sense? Not really, no. Okay. Uh, because Good. we have been talking about burden sharing, we've been talking about the Europeans stepping up and taking responsibility for their neighborhood for decades now. The Americans really want the Europeans to take much more responsibility. We've tried to do that within CSDP, but as long as NATO exists, then this CSDP project cannot go beyond a very low bar. I see the answer as being a rebalancing within NATO of leadership and responsibility and taking over um, missions on the border and elsewhere. This is what the Americans want, and this is what the Europeans also are looking for. That's why I feel there has to be a strategic dialogue on bonne intelligence. This is to be a strategic project between Europe and America. Because America basically wants to go to the Asia Pacific, does not see Europe as anything more than a distraction, really. I mean, in terms of military power. So I see a, a process within NATO as being fundamental. If you call it a pillar, it doesn't really help. Uh, we don't need a name for it. We need the process to kick off. Let me just say one word, if I may, about European capacity. It has been the received wisdom that Europe could not possibly defend itself without America. A debate has been launched in the last two years, essentially by an article published by Barry Posen in Survival, which is entitled, Europe Can Defend Itself. And he gives a very, very detailed explanation as to why the European Union could potentially be in a position to deter Russia. Now we've seen what the state of the Russian army is, that debate <laughs> is being intensified. Okay. Bruno, very quickly, uh, assuming and hoping that the unthinkable doesn't happen in the French presidential elections, uh, w do you expect Macron to take new initiatives after the election for European defence? Not necessarily. I think he will want to double down on European sovereignty in general. We can discuss at length whether this is the same as strategic autonomy, etc. This is meaningless. What matters is that I think he will be... Recall that this is a guy who said that after having said in October 2019 that there's a risk of brain death, he just said three weeks to two weeks ago uh, there's been an electroshock, which literally means that it's yeah. alive. No, I would expect him to double down on the European sovereignty in general much more then on defense specifically, it will be about energy, data, health, and a bunch of other things. And I think he will want his legacy of a, after a hypothetical second mandate to be really about Europe. His foreign policy legacy will want to be about Europe. He will probably have to make closure. I think he's making it very slowly with his dream of you know, revamping the all European security architecture with a 
benign Russia. I think it's hard for him, but it's, he's coming to closure with this. So he will take the existence and resilience of NATO as a given as long as we don't have a second Trump mandate. Mm -hmm. And his efforts will probably focus more on, in general, about European sovereignty, hopefully with a sympathetic Germany, because it has to be. It can't be something that we do without, uh, uh, without a strong German-French couple, more than European defense per se. But that is just me. This is not privileged information about okay. this campaign or whatever. Daniela, in one minute. Has really the gap between France and Germany in defense narrowed substantially because of Putin? And do we expect <laughs> our initiatives to be at 27 or less? In one minute. Yes. It's easy. Easy for the second part. It, it's going to be less than the EU 27. We will work in smaller groups, and I think that's good. Um, has the gap narrowed? I mean, in terms of strategic thinking, the differences are deep and they are still there. That's why the Franco German dialogue is so absolutely important. If there is a German strategic culture, it is still very much NATO. Um, and that's why I, I really don't see that opposition so strongly. Germany is now writing its first security strategy, and the, um, the context for that is the strategic compass to some extent, but also the ongoing debate on NATO strategic concept. So I, I really can't see that opposition in such a strong way. And for the question on the European pillar within NATO, I don't think we disagree the way you answered it now. Because it's absolutely clear that Europe has to contribute more and that our responsibility right now is shared with the US vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the US are actually enhancing their role to the extent that Europeans export arms to help Ukraine and the US backfill that by providing defense you know, to countries who are actually giving a lot away. Um, but I do think we will end up in a situation, and we should, where Europe pays a lot more attention to its neighborhood builds the capabilities to actually do that because one thing won't change, the US sees China as the key strategic challenge, militarily but also in all the other dimensions, tech, economic and so on. And so Europe will have to take more responsibility and I'm more confident um, that this can happen in a coherent way as European cooperation within the EU in groups and then making it compatible with NATO and this discussion in my perspective is ongoing all the time. Okay. I think we had a very good discussion and many more such discussions will be needed in the months and years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.